we ultimately want to do is use the tools we've acquired so far, namely utility maximization, um, constraint optimization, and Edgeworth boxes, and the analysis of a general equilibrium. We want to use this for policy analysis. So we want to see to what extent does the intervention of a government through taxes and transfers actually affect the consumers in this market or in these markets or in this economy. Now to do so, we need to introduce a very important concept and that concept is called Pareto efficiency. So Pareto efficiency always refers to a particular consumption point in the economy. And so that's what we call here a position. So a position or a consumption point is, parade, is considered Pareto efficient if no reallocation can be found that improves the situation of one agent without at least making one agent worse off. Okay? So, so, so in other words, um, if I'm at a point where the only way to make someone worse, someone better off is actually uh, to make someone else worth, worse off, that's, that point is to be considered Pareto efficient. So I cannot move away from that point and say I give more to Andrew without harming Betty. So if you think about the last videos where we talked about potential gains from exchange, we looked initially in, at an endowment point and said, well, at that level, if each just consumes their endowment, very often you have potential gains from exchange. So at least one person, if not both, can be made better off through exchange. And so that fact of the two of them being made better off is called a Pareto improvement. So if we can improve the situation of one person without harming anyone else, that's called a Pareto improvement. At a point that is Pareto efficient, we can no longer do Pareto improvements because if we were to improve the situation of one person, we would make someone else worse off. Now this all may sound very abstract, so let's look at this graphically. Let's look again at uh, the endowment point that was somewhere here, omega, and remember that we had uh, we had indifference curves that go through this uh, this endowment point. Okay, and and so from the perspective of Andrew and Betty, um, clearly there are gains from trade or gains from exchange because there is this, 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 this lens that opens up and any point within this lens would at least make one person better off. Okay? So, so even if we move, let's say, to a point that is here, um, that would still make Andrew better off and the utility of Betty would be the same. Now that's obviously a limiting case, but, but it would still mean a Pareto improvement and any point within that lens we would consider a the move to that point a Pareto improvement. Right? Now, where do we get to a Pareto efficient point? Um, a Pareto efficient point is one where, once again, you can no longer make one person better off without making someone else worse off. So let's look at a point that could be a market equilibrium. So let's look at, uh, let's first of all introduce here a budget constraint that goes, as we've learned, through the endowment point. And then let's say we have a, an equilibrium point whereby we have indifference curves that are tangential to one another. Um, and so we have then a, a consumption point X, which is this. Okay? So if we have that, so at that point, and, and assume here, I didn't draw this very well, but assume here that, that those two indifference curves are tangential to one another. 
So here, um, from point X, we cannot move away and make someone else better off without making someone else worse off. So suppose we move um, from point X to point, um, let's, let's go in here, to point X prime. Okay. So then obviously for Andrew, this would be better. He would reach a higher utility level. But for Betty, it would be clearly worse. Okay, and, and if in from point X, I can basically go in any direction, I will always make one person worse off and the other person better off. And so for that reason, because wherever I go that happens, that point X is a Pareto efficient point, a Pareto optimum. Now notice, that Pareto optimum does not mean it's in any way a desirable point, that it's in any way a point that, that is socially optimal, that people would say, yes, that's the distribution of consumption we actually want. I want to make this very clear. So it's, it's not just because it's called efficient doesn't mean it's actually desirable. But it, in my view, it's not a bad starting point to think first about, well, if we had a completely free market where, where people exchange goods and where prices bring markets into equilibrium, um, what are the, 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 the points, the allocations where A, we have an equilibrium and, and B, what are the characteristics of this equilibrium? So could we move away from this point uh, and, and make both of them better off? That's great. But if we have to harm someone to make someone else better off, that introduces obviously some, some sort of trade-off and, and that makes redistribution or any policy intervention here a lot trickier. Okay? That, that's why we need to, to think very carefully about Pareto efficiency. So if, if we are in a, in a consumption point that is not Pareto efficient, such as Omega in, in this, this, uh, this graph, um, you know, the first thing a government can do is they, they may try and nudge people to a different consumption point if they don't do it by themselves, to a consumption point that lies within that lens. But if we are already at point X, then it will be very hard to move uh, to, to a different consumption point. Um, to, you know, you wouldn't get people to move there unless you force them to. Why? Well, because uh, you would harm at least at least one of the two people here. Um, but what you should also realize is that depending on the endowment points, there are many possible uh, Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient allocations. And the, the locus of all those points where those two indifference curves are tangential to one another is called the contract curve. So when you think about this, again, from the perspective of uh, Betty, the indifference curves look something like that. From the perspective of Andrew, they look something like that. You have a lot of potential uh, points where the two of them are actually tangential. Okay, and, and so, so the, the, the curve that goes through all those tangential points and potentially even more, that red line here, um, that is called the, the contract curve. So at any of those points, um, I would have a Pareto efficient allocation, but obviously there is only one endowment point in that economy at least initially. Okay, so, so uh, in, in, in the case, uh, in the previous slide, the endowment point was somewhere up here. And so if the price vector is, is such, then that point A is the equilibrium point. That's the Pareto efficient point, but you do not, but, but it's not the only Pareto efficient allocation we can have. Okay? And that is a crucial insight because what a government can do and what it actually does in most countries is it taxes some groups of people 
and it gives transfers to others. And so what that means in, in many cases um, is the government takes away the endowment of some groups and gives to others. So here, for example, we would have a, a situation uh, where, uh, you know, where, where we reach a consumption point here um, where Andrew consumes relatively little um, and Betty consumes a lot. And we may say, well, we actually would like to have a more equitable distribution, not of endowments, but of consumption. And so what we can do then as a government, we can say, well, you know, the point B would actually be much better. Okay, because it's more equitable. What can we do? We can actually, through lump sum transfers, move the endowment to a new point, let's say here, omega prime, and then obviously the, the, the budget constraint shifts by the same amount. It's basically just a, a shift in the intercept of the of the budget constraint. So you know Betty gives is getting taxed. Andrew is getting a transfer of the exact same amount that just leads to a parallel shift in the budget constraint. And so then through trade from that new endowment point, they reach point B here. Okay? And then point B may be the point that is more desirable. I'm not saying here that all redistribution is that simple, but again, this is a very important starting point because we can then also think under what conditions is, is this redistribution actually harmful in a sense that it, that it distorts the economy and shrinks the pie, which is what a lot of free market advocates claim, and under what conditions is this actually not true. So, before we go into redistribution, which is what we're going to do in the next video, let us first think, uh, let us first revisit the first fundamental welfare theory. Right? And let's view it through the lens of Pareto efficiency. Right? Um, and what the first welfare theorem simply tells us is that um, the allocation of commodities at a competitive equilibrium. So at any point where those two, la those two uh, indifference curves and the budget constraint are tangential is Pareto efficient and as such maximizes the size of the pie. Okay, so if, if we have an endowment point, let's say that is that that sits somewhere here, um, if we have an endowment point here and we reach point C, that would then maximize welfare in that economy because it, it basically it makes for the given budget constraint and given the preferences, the utility of Betty is maximized, the utility of Andrew is maximized. What the first welfare theorem doesn't tell us is what would be, from a societal perspective, the most desirable allocation of consumption and how we would reach that. But there is a second welfare theorem and that will be the, the topic of the next video. But just to reiterate here, what the first fundamental welfare theorem tells us is that if, if we have no intervention in a market, we actually attain a an outcome that is efficient okay so, so so the size of the pie without that intervention in this simple economy is maximized and the allocation we're getting is pareto efficient and then in one of the next videos we will think about well what under what conditions can we actually achieve a more equitable distribution of consumption without harming the economy that is without shrinking the size of the pie.